Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lucy Pierpont, and I'm the Marketing and Special Events Director at the Kent Memorial Library. The library is excited to welcome you to this very special art talk and conversation between artists and valued Kent Memorial Library staff members, Lucy Pierpont and Maria LaFontaine. They will speak with each other about their artwork, which is currently on display in a joint exhibit in the library's gallery and online. The conversation will be followed immediately by the Kent Library Association annual meeting. Helping us this afternoon is our technology point person, Amanda Myers. Thank you, Amanda, for being the behind the scenes genius. And now I'd like to welcome our special guests, Marie LaFontaine and ironically me, Lucy Pierpont. Maria, I have, hi Maria. Hi. Maria, I have worked, Maria and I have worked together at the library for six years. Our shared office space is located in the loft. And that is why we called our joint exhibit Lofty Spirits. When we began working together, neither of us knew that we shared a common love for photography. Each of us was busy taking photos on a daily basis as amateur photographers. So when we began showing each other our work, we decided to have an exhibit together in the future at the library and put our names in for the future date of 2021. And finally, here we are. <laughs> Maria, Tell us what you do at the library as administrative secretary. Well, as administrative secretary, I write a lot of letters. I cut checks and I pay bills. I make monetary deposits and take money in. I may maintain the patron database and the financial spreadsheets. Lately, because of COVID, I've also been selling some donated books online through eBay, which has been an exciting and new way to um, get taken some money for the book sale, seeing that the book sale cannot be active at this point. Um, I'm also spending some time lately at the circulation desk, which is a lot of fun, and I'm learning how to circulate books and answer many questions patrons have. Wow. It sounds like you're invaluable. <laughs> no, not quite, but <laughs> yeah, pretty much. You pretty much keep that place running. Oh, it's fun. Yeah, it is fun. I've had the good fortune to visit your picturesque farm, Mountain View Farm on Fuller Mountain Road in Kent. In addition to your part time job at the library, you are running this farm, caring for animals, growing vegetables. I don't know what else you do, but how does your photography fit in with your busy schedule? Well, I have the privilege to live in a very picturesque place in this beautiful town of Kent, Connecticut. So it doesn't take much to go outside and find something that's worth capturing. Um, as I'm working outside farming, I do find lots of interesting things that I'd like to take pictures of. And not every picture is worth saving or captures the moment, but lots of times they do. And, and that's why today I have photographs that I'm happy to share with everyone. Um, there's, there's lots to see out in nature with the changing seasons and with things growing. The natural growth process of plants um, is just a wonderful thing to take pictures of. Yeah. So we'll see. <laughs> Yeah, you're next. <laughs> uh oh. So tell us what you do at the library as marketing and special events director. Oh, boy. Let's see. Um, well, for 10 years, I've had the good fortune of designing and executing all kinds of adult programs from conception to putting the chairs back in the closet. These programs include technical education, author, artist, musician, talks, nature programs, theme programs, the sky's the limit. Not only do I design the programs, but I have to make sure somebody attends them. Cross my fingers that the presenter is present 
and that his or her PowerPoint or movie is technically supported. Each program or event needs to be publicized. It is a never ending yet extremely interesting job. I can't recall at one dull moment. And let it be known that your attendance to your programs is very high and your programs are wonderful and sought well, after. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So in addition to your part-time job at the library, you also work part-time at Clem Real Estate in Washington Depot and keep your freelance business going. How does your photography fit in with your busy schedule? Well, Maria, like you, I think the busier you are, the more time you might be able to find for a little bit of time for things you like to do. And I really, every day I try to take a walk outside and that's usually when I have a chance to capture some of my work. I'm so lucky. I live in lovely, a lovely Connecticut town and work in two picturesque towns, Kent and Washington. I also love to travel and my camera is with me wherever I go. And I'm not going to tell you that it's in my phone, but it is. Um, uh, the photos in the exhibit do not include people. However, I've been taking photos of people at adult programs or fundraising events for the library for 10 years. I think it's very hard to capture good event photos. Many years ago, I worked in the public relations office at Hartwood College. One of the college's sports photographers told me he always tried to have three things happening in his action sports photos. I often think of that unsolicited advice and have kept it in the forefront of my brain, attempting to have that happen in my photos. I'm not, not definitely sure this happens every photo I take, but, and like you, Maria, I don't keep all my photos, but I do find it hard to get rid of them. So that's a, that's a dilemma that maybe we all have. I have way too many Absolutely. photos. Absolutely. So it is sometimes really hard to decide which ones to keep. In fact, it was a little decide, hard to decide which ones to use for the show. Did you have that problem? I certainly did. Um, incidentally, one little side story. When we chose the date for our exhibit, we never, ever, ever dreamed our show would be presented with such limitations due to the ongoing COVID situation. We, of course, would rather be throwing a fun reception at the gallery inside the library where we could celebrate together. So this program is our solution. Cheers. And now Cheers. we're going to sit back and you are all, the audience is all going to enjoy our entire show. So sit back and relax.
As a grower, I spend much of my time in nature. I have witnessed many amazing moments of incredible beauty. I make a point to take in my natural surroundings each day and reflect. For me, there is no greater peace. It has always been my goal to work with nature in a symbiotic fashion, creating only that which is intended. I am happy to share some of my favorite captures. I do not go seeking objects to photograph. Rather, my photographs are moments out of a normal day in my life that I stumble upon. They are simple, serene, and a constant reminder of the incredible beauty in nature. Right now, we're gonna take a look at some of the photographs that I have hanging at the Kent Memorial Library. And I'm gonna just um, talk briefly about them. Um, the first one is called Rhubarb at First Light. And this is one of my favorites. This is a picture of rhubarb just popping out of the ground in early spring. If anyone knows what rhubarb is, it's a perennial um, in the fruit category. That's usually um, long pink stalks and broad green leaves. And you can cook with the stalks um, and make wonderful recipes. Very early in spring, um, farmers have to get going before there's ever anything really wonderful happening outside. So lots of times it's still very chilly in the morning and cold and kind of bland looking out there, but we got to get those early seeds in the ground. So this particular morning, I was walking out bundled up, um, walking through the fields and it was quite drab, but there was light shining through, the sunlight was shining through and I was looking down and I stumbled upon just some little sprouts of rhubarb coming up out of the ground. And it was just a delightful scene. Um, these tight curly green leaves were sprouting up and their edges were all pink and purpley. And I got very excited. So I had to run back and get my camera and come out. And this, what you're seeing is a super close up shot of rhubarb just popping out of the ground in early spring. And you can see even the soil is just giving way to this rhubarb plant. And this is just, it's a great, it's a different perception of what rhubarb looks like. And I really love this picture. So now we're gonna go to straw flower. So straw flower again is one of my favorites. Flowers are a wonderful thing to take pictures of. Um, they're beautiful in every st stage. They're beautiful when they're tight buds. They're beautiful when they're just starting to open up their petals and when their petals are falling off. Uh, there's so many ways you can take pictures of flowers and it's just, they're so inviting. There's their nature's uh, innocent children, as someone once said. So this is a straw flower and I grow straw flowers because I love the colors and I love how easy they dry. Um, when they're at this stage, uh, you can clip them, take them inside, they will dry very nicely and they'll fan out a bit more into a full flower and you can have them for crafts, you can have them just in a vase for years. I mean, they're just gorgeous. Uh, so I grow lots of straw flowers. Uh, this one in particular was in this year, uh, not this year, but like three years ago. And it was the first straw flower of the year. And it was just opening and it was so vibrant. It was this vibrant orange. And I got very excited once again and had to go find my camera uh, to take a close up of this picture. And I love this picture because it's got the tight bud underneath it. It's just, it's again, one of those moments in time that I was able to truly capture. And that leads us to the next straw flower, straw flower two, which I just wanted to show you as well, because it's actually a straw flower um, in a more open state um, and it's pink. And if you look at this straw flower, you see all the different shades of pink and it's just, it's vibrant and beautiful. And, and along the sides of the photo, you can see other flowers that are just as vibrant in different colors. Um, again, just one of those, those photos that I just so, I enjoy so much looking at. Um, now we're going to move to one called wet eggplant. 
So the photo you see here um, is the one I have hanging is actually more zoomed in. You don't see the actual bowl. Um, so it's more, um, the bowl's kind of out of the picture. And I have it framed and it's a canvas. Um, I have it developed in canvas. Um, and it's just spectacular because it's, it's purple eggplants and all different colors of peppers. This is a September harvest and it's sitting in a bowl of water and the way the light reflects on the water and the shadows, and there's even um, a few imperfections in the eggplant. It's, um, it's a stunning picture and it's one that I really love. Uh, we're gonna move on to blue claws. So the next picture is blue claws. Blue quads. So every year we go to Maine and we do a lot of hiking along the shoreline. Um, and I take lots of pictures, uh, shells and rocks and rocks in water and, and water uh, and boats. But uh, this particular hike, I stumbled upon these two claws and I just loved how the tips were blue. Um, so I put them against the rocks and the rocks have a little bit of orange moss to them. And I took a picture and once again, I've captured a moment in time that when I look at it, it brings me right back to hiking that shoreline. It was a nature preserve in Booth Bay Harbor. And finally, we're going to look at one last picture. It's Monhegan through the looking glass. This picture I really like for its composition. It has foreground, midground, and background. Um, if you've ever been to Monhegan Island, it's a beautiful place to hike the cliffs. Um, and it's just, the views are gorgeous. It's, it's kind of hard to capture what you're seeing. Um, it's just so spectacular. It's like you have to be there to really, to really feel it. But I really love this picture out of all the pictures I took on Monhegan. Um, because it was, we, had, we were hiking and we just came through that crevice and I happened to turn around and take a picture from behind. And later on when I looked at it, I really liked it because, you know, we had come through the crevice between the rocks and right down below was the water where we had just walked and the water was so blue that day. And then out in the distance is the hill that we had just come off of. And it, to me, captured the whole event of spending the day on Monhegan Island. So that is um, some pictures I wanted to share with you. And now we're gonna we're gonna see um, we're gonna go back to Lucy. From an early age, I have had a relationship with art. My curiosity of how books get published to wondering how the designs arrived on cereal boxes or who created the designs on faux wood grain on my desk at school because I certainly wasn't listening to the teachers. I was looking at the faux grain on my desk wondering who made this and what factory did they do it in. I was insistent on getting to the bottom of my quest to learn about the trade called commercial art. I majored in art in college and have been a graphic designer ever since. Whenever I'm out walking, I take lots of photos of things I appreciate. And like Maria, everything is, is so beautiful. I can't even believe my good fortune half the time because I don't set up any of the photos. They're just waiting for me to take them. Uh, I realize how fortunate I am that I am able to see such beauty. And I have chosen some works to share with you. I wish I could share them all, but I can't. So I've chosen a few. And the first one is Morning at Lake Clossipog. And this photo is not new. I took it in 1976. I had a job at Quasi Amusement Park 
Before we opened the gates each morning, I took a walk around the park along the lake. And Quasi Amusement Park is in Middlebury, Connecticut. The park had a personality all of its own before the screaming children descended upon us. You'll be happy to hear that I was the helicopter operator for the summer. I was one of the first female ride operators they hired and soon learned that women actually watched the children on rides and cared for them. But anyway, I digress. Um, I just, they, these are paddle boats and they were parked every night and each morning there they sat waiting and I just, they were really beautiful in very primary colors, which have faded unfortunately, but um, I, I just love that photo and I wanted to share that with everyone. Um, my next photo is called Calm Before the COVID New York City. Um, I took this photo on March 8th of 2020 in Central Park before the 3 p.m. matinee of West Side Story. It was a lovely early spring day. Um, doesn't look like too many people were in the park, but there were because it was a really beautiful day and we kind of didn't really know what was coming by the end of the following week. Um, but by the way, there was not an empty seat in the theater that day. Um, so, but a week later, Broadway was shut down and I'm sure the park didn't have too many people visiting it either. Anyway, it was a beautiful, it's such a beautiful park. You could just, I could take pictures there all day long. Just beautiful. Um, and my next photo is called Cove Collective. And this is one of those photos that was just there waiting for me. I was in Ogunquit, Maine, walking across a footbridge in Perkins Cove, when all of a sudden these boats turned toward me and stood at attention. And they all look like every single one of them have eyes and they're all like smiling at me. So it just made me so happy. Um, and my next photo is called Ghost Ranch. And this has quite a bit of meaning for me because um, it's one of my fun trips to New Mexico and being a Georgia O'Keeffe admirer, I thought, well, I can't go to New Mexico without going to Ghost Ranch to go on some hor horsebacks and visit the home where she lived for a little while in Abiquiu, New Mexico, and where all of those mountains are that she painted, which I love. And uh, this was quite a, an experience to be riding through this land. We were not galloping whatsoever. We were just slowly walking because most of us were novices. And even if we had ridden when we were younger, it didn't come back as quickly, nor did I have the ability to ride. In fact, I was wondering how I was going to get on the horse or off it. But anyway, it was really fun. And uh, I love the colors of Ghost Ranch. And I just wanted to share that with you. And my final photo that I'm going to share with you is probably not, you're probably not seeing this for the first time if you saw our advertising for our show because this is on the poster. But this is another photo that was just sitting in a restaurant waiting for me to take a picture of it. And I just can't believe how cool it is. And it's called Cohorts. And I don't really know what else to say about it, except for that, how lucky was I to come upon these lovely crayons in their primary colors, which I love. And that is my show. Now I'd like to wrap things up and thank Maria for sharing your beautiful photographs and thoughts about them with us, uh, Maria. You are a fun office mate and a fun 
exhibit partner. So thanks a lot. And I hope everybody out there enjoys our photos together. And Lucy, thank you for doing the same. It's been really, it's been a lot of fun and it's given me reason to really look at my photos in depth and, and put them into matting and framing and the works. And I just so appreciate the opportunity. It's been wonderful. We'd like to remind you that you can go to the library's website to see our exhibit and to see our, all our wonderful photographs. And we're gonna walk you through right now how you would get to them. So where the green arrow is, you would click on events and exhibits. And that's going to bring you to our icon. So you would click on our icon. And then it says online gallery. Right there, you would click on that. And you will be able to view all of our lovely, well, no, there's one more step. After that, you're going to click on Local Artist Gallery. And once you do that, you will be able to view all of our beautiful photographs. And if you have any interest in any of them, you can follow. There's um, information on how you can contact us and purchase any photo that you wish. Thank you. And now we join the library's annual meeting. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much. We do um, have an opportunity to do a little Q&A with the artists. So if anybody has um, a question that you'd like to ask Lucy and Maria, they are here with us. I don't see Maria, but I think she's around somewhere. Um, all you need to do is you can just type it right into the chat and I will ask the artists. Um, right now, there's a few comments sitting in there. We have uh, wonderful pictures. Thanks for sharing them. That's from Linda. Sorry, good friend says, thank you, Lucy and Maria. Great talk and beautiful photos. I know how difficult it is to edit down to the best of the best. Great job. Um, Sandy Edelman asks, do Maria and or Lucy edit photos using filters? That's a good question, Sandy. Lucy, why don't you uh, respond to that one? No, I do not. The only thing I have done, one of the photos, uh, I did quite a bit of Photoshop too. I took out telephone wires, but no, no filters. How about you, Maria? I have never used any filters, although I would like to try it. Um, and also I've never used Photoshop, but I know that there's all kinds of neat tools out there and I'd actually like to give it a try because um, you can come up with some pretty spectacular effects. Um, as a follow-up question, Janet Rifkin was wondering what kind of camera you use, Maria. Lucy already spilled the beans that she uses I her iPhone. Up. What, do you, what do you use? Well, I have a Canon Rebel, and I really love it. Okay. It's a great camera, and it's and got it's a digital. lot of auto, you know, auto. So mm -hmm. I don't do too much manual. So in a way, it's kind of cheating nowadays because years ago, you really had to know your way around the camera. And nowadays, you really don't need to know that much to get a really good focus. Um, but sometimes, you know, I mess with the manual part, but for the most part, auto works. Wow. All right. Uh, and then another question from John Walker. He wanted to know where in Maine were you when you were taking those photographs? So the blue claws was in Booth Bay Harbor. We were on a preserve and I'm not quite sure which one it was or the name of it, but they're basically jetties out into the ocean uh, and wonderful views. Booth Bay Harbor is mid Maine and it's, it's a gorgeous place to be, much less populated than Southern Maine. So if you've never been up that far, I highly recommend it. And if you can get up even further, I recommend it more because it's it just gets more and more stunning. Uh, lots of cliff sides, the ocean. Uh, the second picture was on Monhegan Island, which again is one of those, you have to take a ferry out to it, um, but it's worth it time and time again. I've been there three times and I can't get enough of it. It's about 10 miles out and they have power and there's people that actually live there year round. But for the most part, it is an artist colony, uh, but the cliffs and the ocean side is just amazing. 
as you walk. They've got some life preservers in different spots. And they also warn you as you get off the boat that anyone that falls in doesn't make it. Wow. Um, Sue McQuinney asks or comments that she loves the brilliant colors of the vegetables, but wanted to know if she saw a Newport photo, Lucy. Well, she sure did. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite spot to go. Nice. Um, any other questions for the for the artists since we have them here? I was wondering, Lucy, if how you feel like your graphic design training informs your photography. Wow, that's a tough one. Sorry. That is a very tough one. Why didn't you ask me that yesterday so I could think <laughs> about it? Um, I don't even know if they're even related or if I just am always thinking of composition. I, that's probably what the answer is. I'm always thinking of composition Well, I find, subconsciously. You know, the posters that you create for the library are always incredibly balanced in a way that um, it looks it looks natural. It looks like it just happened, but I'm sure it doesn't. So I'm are you do you feel like it uses that same part of your brain then? I don't I don't well probably the same side side of my brain, but um, I don't know if there's balanced images on in any of my photos. I'm not really sure. I haven't looked at them that way. I I would I personally think yes. They oh, are very okay. <laughs> they are very balanced. That's why they're attractive. Oh, um, thank you. Uh, Janet Rifkin comments. Everyone should know that Lucy posts wonderful art every morning and every evening on Facebook, and it keeps us even during these hard times. Where do you and, find the art that you like to post? And it's really really fun to do. I, every day I go on Pinterest and I have learned so much about so many artists and even met a few of them this year because I I'm a stalker apparently. I like to <laughs> to meet the artists. Um, and but so Pinterest and then I just copy and paste them on into Facebook. And are the artists generally well known or are no, they? No, most of them are not. Most wow. of them, and sometimes I don't even know who they are because it's um, in Japanese or something. So I really don't know. Um, and they don't always, they aren't always identified, but it's kind of fun to try to find out who they are. Is that legal to do that? No, I'm not going to. Throw I you don't under know. the bus or anything. You don't know. Well, I'm not <laughs> selling anything. I'm just sharing the beauty of art. And there are so many people doing beautiful artwork. Yeah. Cool. Um, any other questions for our artists? I don't see anything. Well, please come to, uh, well, please go to our show online. I guess you're not going to be able to come to the library and look. And um, you can look at, at your convenience and we would be happy to help you in the shopping department. <laughs> I can also, if someone has their eye on a, on a photograph, I can bring it to the front door and, and you can actually look at it. It's, they do look different online than they do. in. They person. do. So I'm absolutely happy to do that for anyone who has something that they're, they've, they've got their eye on. Okay, well, thank you so much, Lucy and Maria. We well, appreciate thank you. The, thank you. We thank appreciate you the show us. and your, the, your thoughts about it. Thank, uh, thank the library very much. Thank that wonderful program person for all the help she gave me. She's great. Uh -huh. <laughs> thank you, Lucy. Thank you, Maria. Okay, I think we're going to transition into the annual meeting. We hope you'll stay with us, especially because after the meeting, and the meeting will be quite brief, after the meeting, there is a slideshow put together by Lucy. Um, and the only way I can describe it is it's a balm, a balm to the soul. It's been a very difficult year for many of us. Um, the library has had its ups and downs, um, but, and it, it's hard to think, you know, there were good parts of 2020, but when you see this slideshow, I do believe you will feel that. You will feel that there were some good things that happened in 2020. We certainly had some wonderful successes and um, 
there's there's evidence there's photographic evidence so um why don't we jump on in i would like to introduce sandy edelman and jim blackadder who are the co-presidents of the library to do a little welcome and then we'll proceed with the agenda of the meeting okay can you hear me now yes okay well i I think, uh, can Jim be unmuted? Because Jim is going to give the welcome for both of us, and then I'll cover some topics later in the meeting. He is unmuted. There he is. Okay, there Jim, am. you're on. There my video. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us this morning. And thank you especially to Lucy and Maria for sharing their, their work with us. Um, I guess most of you know me. I'm Jim Blackheader, and Sandy and I are co-presidents of the library board. Um, We'll be back later in the meeting, but for now, we'd like to turn it over to Sarah, our August Executive Director of the Library, who will serve as our MC this afternoon. Sarah? All right. The first item on the agenda is the election of the directors. Uh, so Sharon Hartwick has the slate to present to the membership. Um, we have a board of 20, so there's always something happening there. Sharon? There you are, you have to unmute. Okay, I'm getting different messages here. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> thank you all for coming. Um, I hope you all enjoyed the program. I sure, I'm sure you did. We're so lucky to have Lucy and Maria with all their talents and many skills and abilities working for the library. So it's, it's really a wonderful thing to to feature them as uh, uh, for this annual meeting. Uh, I am the vice president of the board um, and I'd like to just bring you up to date on our board of directors and uh, changes going forward. So we have 20 directors. Our newest director is Sam Calloway. He joined us uh, in 2000, in uh, March of 2000. 2020. Uh, 2020. What did I say 2000? <laughs> 20, I'm sorry about that, 2020. Yes, he just, just joined us last spring. Uh, and, and we have um, a number of directors who are currently serving two or three year terms who are not up for renewals right now. And we also have nine directors who are up for one year renewals. Uh, the, the nine include uh, Jim and Sandy, our co-presidents, Jan Bourne, Rudy Mulho, Ruth O'Mara, Janet Rivkin, Rick Bazzari, John Youngblood, and me. Um, and the other directors who are not up for renewal this year include Eric Roper, who joined us in 2019, uh, Ellen Horvitz, P.H. Narjale, Betty Ruddy, Julie Saxton, John Walker, Dana Slaughter, Michaela Lawrence, Carol Lynn, and Sharon Norton. So what we'd like to ask you all to do, those, those of you who are members, of the Camp Library Association, if you would approve these changes for the next year going forward, which would include Sam joining the board and the other nine directors I mentioned who are renewing their one-year terms. They've all agreed to stay on with us, which is always a good thing. So if, uh, if we could have somebody do a motion to approve these directors, and I know you can't necessarily speak out, so we're kind of just going to do a hand raising, if you Carol don't. Carol Lynn has made a motion to approve the slate. Okay, and can somebody second that? Julie Saxton seconds it. Okay, and all in agreement, everybody who can approve? I'm not allowed. <laughs> I have to show the hands. Okay, oh, it's all approved. Okay, so all, no, are there, there are no nays, I assume, nobody's opposing, so we will go ahead with this new slate. So um, thank you all very much. Uh, we do need to um, approve the minutes from last year. They were circulated to the board members. Um, so again, I just need to see a show of hands that everyone has approves the minutes from 2020, 2020's meeting last year. Okay, all in favor. Thank you, everybody. Uh, next is uh, a presentation from Carol Lynn and Sharon Hartwick also again to discuss the upcoming Library Centennial, which will be uh, happening soon. So Carol and Sharon, please take it away. Okay, you go ahead, Carol. Okay, 
Well, we had our first meeting in December um, and um, we have a lot of very enthusiastic and talented people who are um, going to be working with us to produce uh, material that will be posted on the website, um, other things that will happen during the course of the year, the quilters will be creating, excuse me, a quilt for, um, for the celebration um, and uh, a, a lot of other things that will be happening. Um, I have to admit, I didn't read the agenda. So <laughs> for this meeting, no so, if you want to join in, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, well, well, we have a, a number of people who have agreed to kind of head up these subcommittees and we'll be doing uh, written histories, oral histories. We'll probably be doing some interviews. Uh, we'd probably like to do some history of Kent with maybe anecdotes or people who have lived in the community for a long time and their relationship with the library. So it's kind of open-ended at this point, but we do have a really good group of people uh, who are very enthusiastic, as Carol said, and they're kind of getting their different assignments. And as we go forward, we're gonna start this program uh, in May of this year. So in the 10 months preceding the centennial date, which is March, 2022, <laughs> we're March gonna have a different program for uh, each month, which will represent a decade of the hundred years, of the past hundred years. So I think it should be interesting. It's gonna evolve, it'll be different. We'll come up with different ideas and hopefully other people will pitch in uh, and, and lend their talents too. So um, I think it'll be interesting. We're also working on taglines right now. We're trying to just have a little bit of a tagline for the whole program. So different people have been contributing to that and we'll probably finalize something uh, in the next few weeks. And then people like Julie Saxton will be helping us with all the social media and Lucy will be helping us with a lot of the graphics. So um, other board members are getting involved. Rudy Mulho and Roz will be doing bios for us. Uh, and uh, so we'll have a lot of help. And you know, if others of you have ideas or wanna pitch in or join, we're open to um, you know, everyone in the community because we do wanna make it a community effort, include all the local people and the businesses and the history. Yes, John. John's on mute. Oh. And we're also talking about creating a banner. That and a banner, right. Quite visible right. and uh, making sure that people hear about what's going on through social media and uh, various other methods. Yeah, and posters and uh, stuff inside, okay. right. And work with the business community too, because maybe they can help us. Right. Sarah is now very entrenched in the Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> for better or for worse, right? <laughs> So she can bring that to us also. If anybody has any questions or suggestions, um, interest in getting involved, you know, let us know. I think half of you are involved already. <laughs> and thank you very much. All right, the next item on the agenda is the library director's report and that's me. Um, I did circulate my report, my annual report to all the board members, but anyone who's not a board member who would like to read it, it is, it is available on our website. Um, I think it's under general information, but Lucy might remember where it is. Oh no, it's actually a banner on the, on the homepage right now. So if you want to see the more details, they, they are there. There's also a um, description of the statistics, a narrative about the, the year's statistics. So it's, it's sort of this year, we almost have to divide it in two before March and after March. Before March, we finished a very large renovation. I, I wish I had the figure. I think it's somewhere between 80 and $100,000 of how much money was eventually spent to renovate the entire interior of the library. But it was a big project involved painters, asbestos, rem asbestos removal and new carpeting all throughout the building. And it looks fabulous. Uh, we really uh, were able to enjoy it for about a month and a half before we had to close. So uh, that the, the biggest part of the project happened in January. We moved the, the library to a different place on the green 
and did manage to continue to circulate materials and, and, and take care of our computer users and things like that. And then uh, about three weeks of, of frantic work, and then we were back in the library. But on March, I think it was March 9th, could be wrong. I think it was March around there, maybe the 12th, we closed the library for COVID and, and that was two solid months of being closed. We then opened to curbside in the end of May. We opened to um, patron appointments in the end of June and really were able to maintain that through November. So we're hoping to open again uh, as soon as we can back to back to appointments. We are watching the COVID rates in the area very closely. So I did want to just hit a few highlights for the year. Um, number one, the big one was the renovation. And we are so thrilled that we were very fortunate that the town helped us with that by giving us an extra grant this year. Um, the other big news for the library was where we had many staff changes. So in November, we received um, two, re two resignations from the children's co-directors, both of whom have gone on to other jobs. And then we received sort of a half resignation from Lucy who uh, will be continuing to work with us in publicity and marketing, but uh, no longer wanted to be involved in adult programming. And then Catherine, who is our longest employee, has taken an indefinite leave of absence and she started that on the 16th of November. So we don't know if Catherine will be back, we'll see. Um, but we have replaced our children's librarians. We have two, uh, two people in that department now, one a local parent, Debbie Morshell, and uh, another uh, woman from Salisbury. Her name is Beth Adams. She comes with lots of library experience. And just this week, we hired uh, Lucy's replacement, and we're thrilled about that. Her name is Brittany McAllister, and she is from, um, well, she's not from Cornwall, but she lives in Cornwall. And I think she'll be a fabulous addition, and she will be very involved in the centennial planning and very involved in um, all the things that we have on deck for the coming year. Um, other highlights, the building program committee convened in, it took us a while to sort of get ourselves organized, but once the, once the committee really got their teeth into the project, made tremendous progress in preparing a building program that is all about what sort of space the library is hoping to have in the future, how we use our space now, what we need, what could be better, how can we better serve our patrons and uh, I would like to put a, a big thank you to Sam Calloway for leading that effort. He really was incredibly organized, continues to be incredibly organized. Um, that was a, a very, very interesting process, including library visits to other libraries. Um, we all have the same issues. We all have the same problems and everybody solves them different ways. And that's what you learn by going to see other spaces. And it was really illuminating. And uh, we're all very hopeful that this building program will actually come to fruition and we'll see what happens next with that. Um, let's see, Masters of Kent. When we had to cancel the fundraisers, the uh, benefit committee and the staff and, and some other good thinkers put together a really fabulous series of programs called Masters of Kent. And we highlighted some of the great talent that we have in this town. And it was really wonderful, uh, very well attended, very well organized. It was intended to be a celebration of the matching campaign and, and a way to say thank you to our to our town's friends. And, um, and it was, it was a really lovely way for people to get together during a time of uncertainty. Um, the matching campaign was tremendously successful and uh, it ended way quicker than we thought it would. So we're all very grateful for that. Uh, for that. Um, things that we changed this year, things that we added, uh, we added more streaming options. We added uh, more access to the offerings that we already had. And then we also now have streaming video. I hope some of you have taken advantage of that. Um, we all became professional Zoomers, I think. Uh, lots and lots of Zoom programs, uh, both for adults and children. And then we were also able to move most of our programming outside. As whenever the weather was good enough to have it, we would have it outside and really had lots of happy people. And I think when you see the slideshow, um, you'll see a lot of the evidence of that. It really was a um, very successful way to run our programs. So um, I think that's all I have. Does anyone have any questions about how the library managed this year? You can raise your hand or you can type them in the chat. 
Anybody? No? Okay, well then I think we can go to the uh, the board president's report. That's Sandy and Jim. Okay, okay. thank you, Sarah. I'll, sure. I'll start out and Sandy will finish up. Um, two important financial events, just in summary, we, we early in the year, we obtained a forgivable uh, payroll protection plan, forgivable loan, which has now been forgiven and allowed us, the library, to maintain staff and to pay for employee expenses, as well as to continue to serve the town. Second, the library relies on these three major event fundraisers, fully a third of our operating budget, the book sale, the gala, and the car raffle. We were forced to cancel all three, but two great friends of the library stepped up. Betty Reddy, a director and head of the development committee, and Ned Babbitt, chair of our investment committee pledged $60,000 in matching funds aimed at covering these losses. And Kent responded, more than oversubscribing for a total in excess of 120,000, which matches what we would have probably gained from our venue fundraisers. Uh, early in the year, Mike, Mark Sabetic, who has served as long and well as uh, treasurer and chair of the finance committee uh, retired uh, to pursue other interests. And uh, we'd like to thank Mark for the, all of the excellent work he's done for us in the past. He's done a terrific job for the library. Uh, John Walker stepped up to assume those responsibilities. And John, I'm gonna ask if, if he could give us just a quick summary of, of some things financial, particularly with the profit and loss statement and the balance sheet. Thank you, John. So Sarah, do you want me to go first though before John? Uh, yes, you can go ahead. Okay, so I'll just finish the directors, the uh, board of directors report. Um, we uh, worked on the strategic plan. We had a retreat in December, 2019, and then we collated everything. We had a consultant and we started drafting the plan in January and February of 2020. And we just about had our first draft in March when the pandemic struck and looking back at the plan, much of it looked like, oh my God, was that like um, a century ago? But much of it will endure, although we have been reminded by the pandemic about the need what we already realize is to have remote programming for weather and other unexpected events, uh, not necessarily a once in the century pandemic. And we also, uh, we actually tweaked our mission statement. So I'm gonna read you our new mission statement. Um, it's the Kent Memorial Library provides a center for collaborative engagement, education and enrichment for the greater Kent community. And that is our new mission statement. Uh, so we're very happy with that. Um, Sarah t told about the firehouse and the, uh, the last major event um, is the creation of a Kent Library Association advisory group, which former board president Ken Cooper uh, graciously agreed to chair and he assembled a group of about 12 uh, people in the Kent community from very uh, diverse group from the business community from educators. Uh, young uh, and different demographic and generation, and just to convene twice a year to advise us on important issues that the library is facing. They actually took a first pass at our draft strategic plan, and we actually hope to meet again with them in the spring and maybe talk about our firehouse plans. So um, that's it for me. Now, John, are you ready to take over on the financial report? I am indeed. Thank you, everybody. Um, let me first just uh, uh, give a shout out to Sarah Marshall, who has uh, been so incredible um, this year, um, both with uh, keeping track of our finances and in every other aspect, which is almost everything uh, that she does. Um, so uh, the, the library's current financial picture is good, considering the challenges of uh, 2020. But it should be noted that opportunities for further one-time grants may not be as forthcoming as they were in 2021. Also, the uncertainty uh, surrounding our fundraisers provides to us a further challenge in 2021. We may undertake another matching campaign this year, but we are evaluating that possibility going forward. That being said, due to our conservative budget for 2020, we were able to exceed projections and our 2021 budget projections uh, remain uh, equally conservative. 
Net revenues in the past five years through 2019 have been growing steadily. Uh, while our net operating income was less than that of 2019, we still managed uh, to be positive. Total net income from the year once again was less than uh, fiscal year 2019, but still on the plus side. Without the benefits of the income generated by the annual gala, the car raffle and book sale, we were able to make up some of those shortfalls by the generous participations of members to our matching campaign. And as noted in Sarah's report, we attained our membership goal for the year. In addition, fundraising activities in the form of an outreach program to donors and to members also helped to fill in part the gap created uh, by the lack of our traditional fundraising ac activities. These contributions accounted in part to our positive bottom line. And despite the market volatility in 2020, we managed a very respectable return on our general investment portfolio and as well our endowment account. Now, the endowment account carries restrictions as to how much may be used for our operating account in any given year, but our general investment account um, has no such restrictions. Additionally, as mentioned earlier, several one-time grants uh, had a positive impact on our bottom line, uh, as reported in the KMLA annual report. Our expenses were impacted by the renovation, which was in, uh, initiated early in 2020 and was completed in February and including new, uh, included new carpeting, a fresh coat of paint, and removal of asbestos. Uh, finally, the library enjoys a very strong balance sheet, again, supplemented uh, once again by the strong performance of our investment portfolios. We continue to be well able to meet our expenses and obligations and expect to continue that trend through fiscal year 2021. Uh, plans have been made to reinstate the car raffle beginning in February, but we are as yet uncertain um, that our annual benefit will uh, in fact take place this year. And we are also uh, hopeful that we can run some form, of out, some form of outdoor book sale this year, but we uh, will await further developments on the COVID front. And with that, uh, if there are any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Thank you, John. Any questions for John or for Jim and Sandy from their report, anybody? I wanna add, I wanted to thank Rudy Malho, who I'm waving at who stepped in as a transitional acting treasurer in between Mark Sebetic and yes, John Walker yeah, and kept yeah. our library going uh, at a very important time under, uh, uh, just stepped up to the plate. I wanted to thank you, Rudy. Yes, indeed, Rudy, thank you. You're here. Uh, the last item on the agenda is the presentation of grants and tribute gifts and that's Sandy. Thank you. So um, many of you know that um, in mid-2019 and early first week in 2020, um, Edmund and Sylvia Morris passed away. They are well-known authors, local Kent residents, and we were very sorry to lose them. Um, but there was uh, some legacy for them in the library. First, their nephew, Anthony Davidowitz, encouraged people upon Sylvia's death to make some contributions to the library in their memory. And we did get a number of really lovely donations, including from uh, Henry and Nancy Kissinger. So I want to appreciate that. And then um, Ben and Donna Rosen, who many of you may know from their, uh, their role in founding Kent Presents, uh, they also wanted to honor the legacy of, of Sylvia and Edmund Morris, and they have funded very generously a lecture series that will be the Sylvia and Edmund Morris lecture series. And it's, we hope it will be a three year, at least three year series, twice a year at least, and starting in the spring to present uh, an author, a speaker, a, a public person who will honor their legacy in the arts, literature, history. So stay tuned for that. Um, Another really old friend of the library, uh, longstanding, I should say, Alan Priol. Um, uh, in the spring, his uh, daughters, uh, Charmin and Beth Priol, uh, as well as um, Alan's best friend, Peter, uh, gave a very generous donation to fund children's programming for the year. And we are so grateful for that. And that's just a continuation of Alan's longstanding work, as well as his wife, Jackie Markham. Uh, we just consider you special friends of the library. Um, we got grants from the Northwest Connecticut Community Foundation uh, to help us um, adjust to the COVID crisis um, to help, you know, put plastic, extra cleaning, plastic barriers. There was a lot involved and, you know, small operating budgets, uh, it's difficult to do that. So shout out for Northwest Connecticut Community Foundation, always with people in the Northwest corner 
most appreciated. We also got a grant uh, for protective equipment from the Berkshire Taconic. Um, and those were the highlights. So uh, I think that's it. And Sarah, maybe you're going, unless there's questions, um, to introduce the slideshow. Right. Are there any questions before we go to the slideshow? It's I, I'm, I'm a little excited to see it myself. I have a question, not a question, but a, a comment. And I think it's important. We all as board members give a great deal, but I would like to give a special shout out to Rick Vizzeri for a lot of these renovations in the library. Yeah, we may get money for the materials, but he does this pro bono. He is always available to do these things. And he had those, pla he had those plastic shields up and everything to protect both the customers and the staff. And I really, really appreciate his work, not just this year, but over the many years. Here, here. Here, here. Okay, shall we go on with our slideshow? Amanda, are we ready? Thank you, everyone. I think once the slideshow is over, we'll all just peel away. So uh, I wish you a, a, a good 2021. I hope to see you in the library. You can start.
enjoyed that, everyone. Thank you. It was a it was a year. I won't say it was a great year, but it was a year. <laughs> One will always remember. Thank you, everyone. Right. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Stay bye. well. Bye all. Good weekend. Bye, oh, everybody. Janet, did you need Take to say care, something? Everyone. No, I just said. <laughs> Yay. Okay. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you.